go to God in prayer as we prepare to hear his word. Uh, change our hearts, O oh God. Change our minds. Change our souls. Change our being. Make us more like you as we study your word together and put on the new life and put off the old. Speak to us now as we join together in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture today is returning back to Ephesians chapter 4. We're looking at verses 17 to 32, the middle to the end of the chapter. And we've been doing a study of Ephesians, uh, which is a general letter by Paul to all the churches. It's not dealing with particular problems, just his general statement about how the church should work and how we should live out our faith. And uh, three chapters are about God's blessings, and then three chapters are about how we respond. Uh, and uh, the first part of chapter 4 was talking about the gifts of the Spirit, some of the things, uh, yes, that uh, God's Holy Spirit unleashes in us as believers, being apostles, prophets, uh, teachers, pastors, uh, shepherds, uh, evangelists, and other gifts. And last week we went and looked at Romans 12, which was another gift of those lists, another list of those gifts. And uh, uh, it's a passage that parallels uh, what we're going to look at today, pretty much. And uh, uh, it's not talking about the gifts of the Spirit here, but more how we continue to respond to God's grace and mercy in our lives. And there are some very esoteric passages in the Bible that are hard to understand, and there are some that are very concrete and down to earth, and we can dig into. This is one of those nice, concrete, uh, very practical passages, because it just gives us a list of things we shouldn't do and things we should do, and uh, when we live this way, we bring peace to God and peace to ourselves. Let's join together in reading God's Word. Now I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. But put off the old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are each members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting or foul talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When Paul was writing to his friends at Ephesus, they were in one of the biggest centers of the Gentile world. Lots of pagan temples were there. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world was in, uh, uh, in uh, Ephesus, the temple to Artemis, uh, one of the fertility gods of the Greek pantheon. And uh, that's the way they organized their life. But Paul had trouble dealing with the prevailing attitudes of that day in culture. And he calls it the Gentile mind. It's the worldview that serves the self first and doesn't recognize the God of the Bible. Oh yeah, there are the Greek gods that get into fights and rape and pillage with each other and on the earth and stuff like that. But that's not the one true God who made us and calls us to a new kind of life. And so Paul, in this passage, begins with his culture addressing where they are and telling his 
Christian friends there in Ephesus don't live that way. And he says the minds of the Gentiles are futile. They're unable to accomplish anything. They are doomed to destruction because they are oriented in the wrong path. And he lists several things about them. They're darkened in their understanding. There's no light in their minds. In fact, they have a life alienated from God. They are spiritually dead and ignorant. Not of, they're not uneducated uh, by any means, but they don't have that right kind of knowledge of wisdom or spiritual uh, 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 knowledge there. They're like animals driven by instinct rather than new creations uh, that God wants to make us. Their hearts are hardened. And God can't penetrate them. They're resistant to God's truth and salvation. Callous, and they've given themselves to sensuality. They live pornographic lives of sexual excess. That's how they organized their worship. Uh, there was called prostitution and other things going on there. And Paul says they are greedy to practice every kind of impurity. They're looking for new vices to cherish. And they resent those who would call them to a different kind of life, a life of holiness and purity. It's a very bleak world that he's talking about here. Now, where do you see this kind of world today? <laughs> is this a foreign world to us at all? Unfortunately, it's not. What does this sound like? Well, turn on your TV. Watch the news every night. Watch a few TV shows. Pick up a magazine at the grocery checkout line. Uh, it, it, every, all of them are full of this exact same stuff. Our celebrities wallow in it, and our TVs sell it to us. It's our modern culture. We're no different from the ancient pagans, except we have more gadgets to play with. That's the only difference. Uh, between us and these ancient people. We've got a little more technology, but we're in the exact same ballpark spiritually. No, I saw this years ago when I went to Las Vegas for a real estate convention between a couple of the churches I served down in South Carolina. Took a few years with selling real estate as Gene and I worked to start the Young Life Youth Ministry down in that area. And uh, Keller Williams uh, is the realty company I was with, and it's a faith-based company, and their values are God, family, and then business, but somehow they wound up having their national convention in Las Vegas. And I went, which I was glad I went once, but uh, a Presbyterian preacher loose in Las Vegas is a fish out of water if there's uh, ever a place there. And I looked around at the hotels. Here's one built like the Pyramid. Another one like the Speaks, another one like the Eiffel Tower, another one like New York City. And there are all these shrines to greed and sensuality all around. Uh, they are basically pagan temples. But the nice way I can put this next thing is the call girls would leave their cards in the bushes by the street. They had baseball cards with their new pictures on them. So people would pick them up and give them a call and uh, go have a fling together. Well, I was kind of intrigued and shocked by all this. But all I can say is this isn't America. This is Rome. This is the pagan world and Ephesus and Rome and Corinth and all those places that Paul visited a long time ago. Uh, and we're not really in a post-Christian time like people say. We've returned to a pre-Christian time because our culture has totally abandoned its spiritual heritage and is reverting back to the ways of the world before Christianity was let loose. And which is really a sad thing to do. It's when you forget the past that you're going to repeat the mistakes all over again that Edmund Burke and George Santayana and all those philosophers have taught us, and that's where American culture is today. We're forgetting the past and we're about to have to go through these lessons all over again. What we've essentially done is Las Vegas, our culture. And it's now built around vice rather than virtue. Remember the founding fathers, they were pulling everybody forward to rise up and be the best that humanity could be. But today, it's the exact opposite. We have everything pulling us down. You can get porno at the click of a button on the internet. The Ashley Madison website was set up for people to arrange affairs, and they had, what, 30 million people? Fortunately, somebody hacked it and exposed everybody's names, and uh, all sorts of people are getting in a lot of trouble, including 400 pastors they found were on there. So they're in hot 
water this morning as they stand up in their church and their churches is wondering, why was your name on that uh, website uh, uh, out there? Uh, now we've redefined marriage for the sexually confused rather than for those who know what it's supposed to be about. Gender can't be recognized. Uh, you can't say you're a boy or a girl, but uh, you've got to leave it for people to decide somewhere later in life. And even now, as we've seen with the videos that have been uh, exposed about Planned Parenthood, we're even willing to sacrifice babies for profit. Do you think God's pleased with this kind of a society or situation? No, I think it's only God's grace and mercy that the lightning bolts aren't coming. And, you know, some people wonder about the droughts and storms. Well, maybe some of those lightning bolts are about to happen. And sadly, even churches are buying into this and celebrating everything unholy. And you're called weird and mean and ignorant and homophobic if you don't go along with that. That's why we're leaving the Peace of USA. The denomination that we've been a part of is buying into a lot of this. They support Planned Parenthood. They're in favor of redefining marriage wholesale to anything else. And uh, if you don't go along with it, they will judge you harshly. I know I'm kind of the odd fish in the Presbytery right now. And it's a real world, weird world going to uh, events of the Peace USA these days as they celebrate things that this book says specifically we can't do. But yet we don't take this down to uphold the scriptures. So I'm, I'm just blown away by it and I'm glad this is a congregation that is willing to stand up for truth. That means we agree about every little piece along the way but we're built on God's truth and God's word. The previous congregation I served down in Fayetteville that only stayed for 13 months before they showed me the door, they were all mixed up about this. They couldn't stand for God's truth. They wanted every new thing to come along, and uh, they were willing to kick me out real quickly because I said, no, God's word doesn't allow that. But rather than have a pastor that upholds God's word, which every church says that they want when they call a new pastor, uh, so, uh, but when you actually do that, they go, ooh, that's not what we really want. Please hit the road. Well, that's where we are today. Paul calls this outlook the old self, this Gentile mindset. And he talks about this is what we've got to put out of our lives because as broken sinners, this is our default setting. This is what we want to gravitate back to as um, People alienated from God. Uh, and so if you take Jesus out of the equation and out of people's lives, this is what they quickly devolve back into. This is the pagan self, the self that Christians leave behind. And Paul's describing here the life of the Ephesians before they met Jesus. Everyone was this way, but Christianity came along and offered a viable alternative, and it took off like wildfire. Now that's the thing that modern society is forgetting and people resent Christianity and Christian values and standards for marriage. Well, in this pagan world, when the, the teachings of Jesus were first brought out, all the pagans were willing to dump it and come to Jesus because they knew the futility of this life, that it only led to death and destruction and heartache and brokenness. And Jesus brought life and peace and abundant joy and all those good things that we all desire. That's why Christianity took over the Roman Empire. These people knew what a dead end they were in, but now we want to go back to it. They lived life for oneself rather than for God or others. As Paul says here, they were corrupt through deceitful desires. Now, all the early Christians in Paul's days know this because they Christianity hadn't been around but about 30 years. So if they were a believer, they weren't raised in a church or a Christian family. They were all converted from paganism, from the Gentile mindset, into the body of Christ. And Paul is reminding him, don't go back. It's not worth it. Yeah, it's tempting at times. There's a lure of the pleasures that are there, but the payoff is not good. Uh, I saw a meme, I actually posted this on Facebook uh, recently, that uh, you know the Bible says the wages of sin is, uh, is death, but the meme says, if the wages of sin were paid immediately, people would not be so interested in it anymore and enjoy it. But because the death doesn't come till later, people think they can get away with it now. But what Paul wants is something different. He offers the cure here. And the cure is to put 
on the new self. Become a new person in Jesus. Born again, renewed, converted, uh, new life, whatever you want to call it there. And he says you put it on, you wear it like a robe. It's a new identity and outlook that comes to us. It's much like a soldier joining the army. One day you're civilian, the next day you're part of the military and you belong to Uncle Sam, you wear a uniform, you behave and act in a certain way. And when you leave the pagan life and join Jesus, you become a soldier of the cross uh, and a servant of God. So it's that whole new makeover, that new identity that you take on as a follower of Jesus. Another way to put it is it's enlightenment. It's that aha moment, that total mental and spiritual orientation that comes from having, uh, as we read last week in Romans 12, where we are transformed by the renewal of our minds. Here in our passage today, Paul puts it as we are renewed in the spirit of your minds. Very much echoes what he wrote to the Romans here. Uh, and we are reprogrammed by surrendering our lives to Jesus and letting the Holy Spirit come in and unleash all the spiritual gifts that are there in the first half of this chapter, where the body works together to build itself up in love, taking care of each other, holding each other accountable, and uh, showing God's grace and mercy to each other. Well, that's how it all works. And the nice thing about this chapter is Paul goes on in the second paragraph to give us some specific ways of carrying this out in our lives. What makes us different? What are the practical implications of taking on this new identity in Jesus? And he gives us seven characteristics here that every Christian should display every day possible. Now we're going to mess up on some of these somewhere along the way. Uh, we don't get these perfect each and every day. But the good news is we have our checklist here that we can go through and things that we can work on at any age with this list. Uh, and so, uh, let's just look at what he has here in the second paragraph. First of all, you tell the truth always. Do not lie to one another. Put away falsehood. Let each one of you speak to the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. You can't work together if, you're on, if you aren't honest with each other. We've got to put away falsehood. No lie. Speak only what is true. As members of the body of Christ, we've got to hold each other up. You can't do that with falsehood. The second thing is manage your anger. How many of y'all have issues there? Any of us have issues with anger and tough stuff? That's what that gets us all. But he doesn't say never be angry. He says be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. There's some time be frustrated in life. That's, that's okay. God made us as emotional people. And it's okay to be angry and express that within reason. But don't let it fester and become a cancer in your life where it each gnaws on you day after day after day because this gives the devil an opportunity to come in and take hold and ruin everything. Where have you seen that lately? Seen that story of the guy who shot two reporters in Virginia? What was his spiritual condition? He claimed God told him to go and do this, which means he was totally off base. But he was so caught up in anger that he took every little word about his race or his sexuality as an insult, and he just let it fester and build in him till he got a gun and went and shot two of his co-workers live on camera. It's unchecked anger at its worst. That's where the devil comes in and takes anger and makes it a deadly, diabolical, murderous thing. So we've got to unpack it by the end of the day. It's okay to be angry, but with your spouse, you've got to say, I'm sorry, I got angry earlier today. Uh, let's work through this with a coworker or somebody else. Don't let it linger and uh, remain unresolved. Now, we've all been there at times when we've got huffy and held a grudge for a while, and did that solve anything? No, it didn't get cured or set right until we went and said, I'm at fault, or hey, I've got an issue with you, let's work this out and see what we can do here. So we got to do this. In every domestic dispute we hear about on shooting in a trailer park or anything like that that we hear, uh, or apartment complex, or even in a big fancy neighborhood, usually comes out of this thing where somebody let anger build up 
until uh, they lost their cool and the devil kicked in. Third thing Paul talks about here is honest work. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Christians got to put the old life behind, whether we were thieves or robbers or liars or cheats or swindlers or just regular ordinary people. It doesn't matter. God's people come from all sorts of backgrounds, some of them very unsavory. But if we do, we've got to stop the bad behavior and replace it with good behavior. And a thief is somebody centered solely on themselves that they'll rip off anybody else and steal their time and energy and labor and possessions uh, and uh, use it for their own benefit. But Christians turn that around. We're to live and to work to take care of ourselves is our first responsibility, but also to take care of other people. We as Christians bring other people along behind us and are embraced by God's uh, God's compassion for others that way. It's the whole spiritual gift. It's the building up of the body. It's uh, contributing to uh, the well-being of the whole congregation or family of faith. But today we have people that want to be leeches, and that's not a good thing. We're to be producers spiritually and economically, giving back to society, giving back to other people because God first gave to us. Number four, watch your language. Anybody have struggles with this one? Let no corrupting or foul talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Uh, this is part of our witness, how we speak to others in the world. And we are ambassadors for Jesus in everything we do and say. And uh, so, do we reflect his character in the words we use? Are we truly diplomatic, trying to build bridges? Are we blowing people apart? So Paul says, no corrupting or foul talk, vulgar, violent language, because profanity is language that really injures other people. And if we use it every day, all the time, then there are those occasions when it's really the language that is the only language that's fitting to use. But if you use it all the time, then you can't save it and use it for uh, those times when somebody takes the front end off of your car when they're uh, not reading stop signs and other things like that. But Paul says use edifying talk. Take the bad behavior out, put it with good behavior. Use edifying talk or language. Language that builds other people up, encourages them, encourages them, puts the other person first, gives them grace, words of blessing. The thing I like to do is I ride down the street and people are cutting me off and uh, shooting me the finger and other things at stoplights and stuff like that. Is God bless them. If they're that angry and frustrated, God bless them. Give them a better day. Uh, that's the best thing I can give them. Number five is do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and we are sealed with that Spirit and we belong to God. We're a Christmas package wrapped up and delivered to our Savior. And uh, because of that, anything we do to our body, we're actually doing to God's Spirit that now resides in us and is unleashing these spiritual gifts and other blessings from God. So we don't pollute our bodies with sin and vice. Anything you do to your body, you do to God's Spirit. We are not our own, the Bible says. We were bought with a price. So we honor God with our body and do not grieve the Holy Spirit. So that shapes what you watch, what you do, what you say, uh, what you eat. All these kinds of things fall under this category. We take care of what God's given us as stewards of his blessings. Number six, remove the negative. Put away the garbage in your life. Throw it out literally in the trash can. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Remember those rioters in Ferguson, Missouri, and Baltimore, and other places around the country? What were they filled with? Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, uh, malice, all these things that Paul lives right here. They had let the sun... Uh, not resolve their anger issues. And because of that, it built up to fester, and they were stuck on the negative. But Paul said, you got to put this away. 
And then finally, you put on the positive. This is the final characteristic. Be kind to one another. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God forgave you. Now, how many of you all deserve God's mercy? Did any of us deserve God's mercy? No. Well, if we didn't deserve God's mercy, what do we do with the person who really doesn't deserve our mercy? We give it to them anyway. Not because they earned it, but because it's what works and what makes life better. We, we, we make the, take the redemptive path in whatever situation that we are in. Uh, be tenderhearted. Forgiving one another as Christ forgave you. You aren't perfect. You need forgiveness. Everybody else around you is imperfect, and they need forgiveness. And this is how the body of Christ works together. We don't hold grudges. We don't hold anger. We don't hold wrath and malice and other things like this. We say, yeah, I'm an imperfect sinner. You're an imperfect sinner. So let's work together, forgive each other. And when we mess up, we laugh. We don't get angry. We say, yeah, I really screwed up there. You screwed up there, too, and we screwed up together. So let's go out and have a, some fun together and put this behind. Well, let me wrap this up. The world oftentimes asks for proof that Jesus is real. You can be that proof. People aren't going to go home and read this in the Bible every day. But they can see you as the living Bible when you carry this out in your life and in your work. Each and every day, wherever you go, work, school, play, working in the fields, uh, wherever you may be around here. This is what the Christian life is all about. Uh, you can show the world to whom you belong. Now, we've had a lot of tragic situations in this country. And some of these have exploded into riots because people were focusing on bitterness and wrath, wrath and violence. But what happened in Charleston, South Carolina, when some crazy racist loon goes in and shoots nine people? How did they react? Did they react with anger, wrath, malice, and bitterness? No. They let the Spirit of Christ rule in them. And that became one of the most remarkable Christian witnesses we have seen in this country in years. Everyone was stunned when that guy stood in the court and they were allowed to speak to him. You didn't see the people as they stood there. But they said, Dylan Ruth, I love you. I forgive you. You took my mother from me. You took my friend from me, my brother from me. But I forgive you. And I pray that you will come to know Jesus and let the anger and malice out of your heart. What a wonderful witness. That's the Christian life. And did they have any riots in Charleston? How did people react there? No, they told the race baiters to stay home. They said, we're going to deal with this on our own. We're going to show the love of Jesus. We're going to carry out the commands of God's word. That's how we can live. They were proof that Jesus is alive and was their Lord. The riots and rioters in Baltimore and Ferguson did not have that power. They were still stuck on the old self. But we need to put on the new self like these folks in Charleston and let the Spirit lead us as the Spirit led them. If God can do it there, He can do it here. So go and do likewise. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for great passages that lift us up and challenges us to move forward. Lift us up here today with your spirit so that we can truly go out and show your grace and mercy to the world. Uh, and guide our little church as to be examples of all the good things you have here and uh, encouragers of people to put away the bad uh, so that they can leave this behind and live in your grace and mercy. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. Uh, guide us as your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand and sing an old hymn of dedication after hearing God's word uh, together, number 676. Oh Jesus, I have promised.